Welcome to the Private Equity Exchange 2007, the only summit bridging the gaps between limited partners, private equity funds, corporate executives, and entrepreneurs. The Private Equity Exchange is the only venue where LPs, private equity firms, corporate executives, and entrepreneurs meet, enabling them to move quickly from ideas to deal crafting. The Private Equity Exchange, the largest private equity event in Europe for CEOs, funds, and LPs. LBO for professionals. Industry structure change, listing private equity funds, the rise of listed funds and funds of funds. Okay, so we'd like to begin by setting the scene for listed private equity and we'll ask Michelle to share with us some of his research in terms of the size, the size of the market and performance. Yeah, I just want to spend two or three minutes on an overview of the listed private equity market. Um, on this slide you can see the historical evolution of the market capitalization of total listed private equity. So these are, companies, these are private equity companies listed on the stock exchange and we've done the analysis back to 93. Um, there are also some companies listed um, uh, that have been listed before '93, um, but we say well, uh, a figure below 10, 10 billion um, euros, um, then it, you cannot talk about an asset class. Um, but we are convinced that we're still at the beginning of this asset class. As you can see, we have now around 80 to 90 billion euros um, of total market capitalization, which is still small. We're still talking about a niche asset class but it's an, uh, it's an uh, increasing asset class, and we're still at the beginning of the evolution of this asset class. Out of these um, 82 billion euros, which we are talking about uh, by today, around 60 to 70 percent are buyout investments, and uh, the mm -hmm. remaining one are either venture capital investments, mezzanine investments, or uh, balance companies, for example, 3i, who would classify as a balance company because they are doing both buyout transactions and venture capital transactions. Uh, in general, you, um, listed private equity is a very heterogeneous asset class. Um, these companies can differ regarding the organization structures, um, investment styles. We have companies focusing only on buyout transactions. We have companies focusing only on venture capital transactions. They can differ in the type of financing. Some of them are not only providing um, equity capital, some of these companies are also providing debt capital or mezzanine capital. Um, they can differ in their geographical investment focus. Um, we have a lot of companies listed in, in, in Europe, but um, they're only listed in Europe, but investing in, in, in the US or in Asia, or I think on a, pen, on a, on a global uh, basis. Um, and then also the pricing of the listed private equity companies is, uh, can differ. Um, we have companies that are trading constantly at a premium to the market, um, but we have also companies that are constantly trading at a discount to the market. So this is also what we're looking at. We are, um, would like to, have, to get a feeling of the current discount in the market or the current premium in the market um, to get also a sense whether uh, private equity is overvalued or, or undervalued at a given point of time. Um, when we look at the geo geographical allocation, um, it's maybe surprising that America has only a market cap of 80, 18 billion euros, whereas Europe has more than or has nearly 40 <coughs> billion euros. This is um, um, or there are simply three reasons um, that are true for this. First of all, in the United States, um, this the limited partnership structure is much more common than in, 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 in Europe, and. In Europe, we have a large bias towards the United Kingdom, and mainly also because of tax reasons, which are now under discussions in the United Kingdom. But this was um, one of the reasons why we have this bias of private equity companies in, in the United Kingdom. And the third reason is that, especially in continental Europe, we have very old um, industrial conglomerates like Vandal in France or Eurasio, um, which are companies that have very long history, more than 100 or 150, 150 years old, but changed the business to private equity just a few years ago, just 10 years ago. Uh, but, but there are huge companies which then um, increase the, 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 the weight of, of Europe. 
And then Asia is an emerging market. We have a lot of uh, companies emerging in, in, in Asia. Um, in general, we can classify three companies. We have private equity companies that make direct investments, um, but we have also listed fund or funds or um, listed fund managers. So private equity companies that are doing, that are launching private equity funds and are generating fee income out of the of the man, of, of the management of these of these uh, private equity funds. Um, so um, this is also what, what what I said on the previous slide. It's a very heterogeneous asset class, and it's kind of difficult to to compare these companies between each other. The last two slides, just to show you um, on a graph how European private equity companies. Um, developed during the last 10 years or the last 13 years. Uh, and we have done a back testing till um, December 93 um, in comparison with the FTSE Europe 300 and the Kakarong 40. Um, you can see it's, well, it outperformed all of the, of the markets. But um, of course, if you invested in the year 2000, um, well, you, you dramatically underperformed all the, of the other investments. It sh this shows all the picture of private equity. And, um, you have also to, uh, would also to mention that in the year 2000, more than let's say 70 to 80 percent of the index was 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 uh, was venture capital investments, whereas by today around the, uh, 60 to 70 percent are bio investments. So the picture changed over the last 10 years, uh, where we in the late 90s and early and and, and uh, the year 2000, we mainly had venture capital investments, whereas today the bias is towards uh, bio investments. And on this page, just for the uh, last four years to 2002, the evolution um, of also of the LPX Europe. Um, we have our own whole index family. Um, we have the global indices like the LPX 50, um, which is, uh, let's say, the, the benchmark for private equity investments. And um, customers are typically using these indices to get a feeling of the pricing in the market, to get a feeling whether in, in also in non-listed private equity portfolio is, is, is valued at a fair price and um, um, also with these indices it's possible to calculate risk and return figures and also to calculate a correlation figure which, which was not possible um, before that. So that just a, just should, should just be an introduction into listed private equity and I would like to hand over to Andrea. Okay, so now we'll have the opportunity to discuss a little bit from the investor perspective. But you've seen um, uh, Michelle has given us some of some of the background. Um, Mark will be presenting the analyst perspective, and he also has the advantage of being a top-rated hedge fund analyst. So he's always aware of what's happening on the hedge fund side and how private equity uh, compares to that. Let's just start, um, perhaps we could, with uh, Maurice uh, talking about who is a typical investor in listed private equity? When does listed private equity appeal? Yes, well, uh, as it was presented earlier, the, 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 there is a huge diversity of players, of listed players. It, uh, and uh, if, you call, if you compare, for instance, the fact that you have, you know, old family holding companies like Vandel, Razeo, Wallenberg, or whomever. Obviously, they have had uh, investors for a long period of time uh, for different uh, reasons. But uh, uh, free eye, if you look at it uh, from a different perspective. But when, if you look at the, at the new breed of, uh, of listed private equity funds which took place in the last five to 10 years, basically at the beginning, and if I take my example as a case, we, I was first of all targeting uh, private individuals because I felt that accessing limited partnership was too difficult for the private individual, A, because of the minimum investment required, usually a few million euros or a few tens of millions of euros reserved for institutions. And the second aspect of it is being obviously investing in a limited par partnership as a lot of uh, administrative burden because you have to have uh, capital calls, capital distribution, and so on and so on. So, so therefore, my first focus was on attracting the private individuals. But very quickly, we discovered that the second, this was a, a small investment base, but very quickly we discovered that there were a lot of institutions which were interested in listed private equity funds because A, either their charter didn't allow them to invest in limited partnerships, 
B because in some cases like uh, unit trust uh, or investment trust they needed a, a, a daily quotation because their investment was included in a portfolio which had to be valued on a daily basis. So therefore, obviously, having a listed private equity funds was attractive to them. And so today, I would say, the new breed is mostly uh, the, the, listed, uh, the listed public, uh, public equities, uh, unit trust, mutual funds, and so on and so on. And then you have a, a, a new breed of investors, which are the, the hedge funds. Why the hedge funds? Because, as it was said earlier, one of the key that difference between a, a limited partnership and a listed private equity fund is that uh, the, the share price is traded on a daily basis either at a premium or at a discount but the discount is fluctuating every day and sometimes the discounts could become very large like in you could have you could have an undervalued asset and therefore uh, a number of, of hedge funds have discovered that they can play if they understand very well the underlying assets then they can play not for the long term, but they can play, uh, you know, just for the short term, just play the, the, the discount uh, of, of the growth. So, so therefore, today you can see that these uh, listed private equity funds are attracting, in a, in a summary, the traditional investors, because some traditional investors can, can, could be interested for balancing reasons, for balancing their portfolio, but a new a new group of investors who, who could not be attracted by traditional limited partnerships. Um, Ian, could you talk a little bit about uh, the liquidity that's offered by listed private equity companies? Uh, how much of a draw is that for p potential investors? Uh, yeah, look, the, the choices an investor has, uh, if they go to a limited partnership, very limited liquidity, they want to trade, they talk to, I don't know, 10 secondary buyers and they either pay a dis big discount if they're not much demand, or maybe they get a, a, a tiny premium when the market has been particularly hot, but it's quite a, a, quite a lengthy process and the transaction costs can be quite high. Uh, so a listed vehicle, clearly you can trade daily. The, the issue I think for most listed private equity vehicles is size. Most of them are not yet of sufficient size to offer real liquidity. So if someone wants to trade them out, they have to be patient, but clearly the dealing costs are lower or the transaction costs whether it's uh, commission or the uh, impact on the share price are lower trading uh, in and out of a listed private equity vehicle than they would out of a limited partnership. I guess to get real liquidity in the stock of a listed private equity vehicle probably need to see uh, market caps of north of a billion euros and then I think we can start getting some real liquidity into these into these puppies. Which, which is not where we are uh, at the moment. Not where many people are. No. Right. So we've heard from two um, managers who invest directly. Um, Joe has a uh, fund of funds. Um, Joe, could you address the question, particularly for people who are currently uh, limited partnership investors? Does listed private equity have any attraction in terms of managing their private equity exposure more proactively? Have you seen any of that activity? Yes, absolutely, Andrea. We um, actually, in, in the roadshow, uh, we talked to a very large spectrum of, of investors in our IPO, and, uh, and a certain, certain element of those investors were existing private equity investors, fairly sophisticated ones. And I think that the, the sheer proliferation of these vehicles is also helping the, the liquidity in the sector and making it more attractive to traditional private equity investors in the sense that uh, whether you're an experienced investor or, or even more importantly a new entrant, you can use listed private equity as a way to keep your cash at work. I mean, the big structural issue with that everybody, the problem everybody has with pri the traditional private equity structure is it's a, it's a capital commitment and mm -hmm. your money, your cash is drawn down over time. And when you're a pension fund manager or an insurance company account manager, you're, you're sitting there, you know, you're not, it's not the, it's not the commitment to what you're being judged on, it's the cash at work in private equity is how you're being evaluated on your asset allocation. So listed private equity absolutely offers that opportunity for those people to keep their, ca get their cash at work as fast and they can sell it down uh, as they need the cash to fund their private fund commitments and then also when they're getting distributions back, they have cash, they can they can park it listed private equity. So it's definitely a useful tool for experienced private equity investors. So Mark, from the analyst's perspective, uh, how would you say the pros and cons of listed private equity versus limited partnerships? 
Well, I think you, you need to make the distinction between, uh, on the pro side, for the, the investor versus the, the provider, the, the fund manager. Um, I think, as, as Joe referred, um, you know, from the investor's point of view, the fact that these vehicles have a daily um, you know, mark-to-market price, I think that's extremely relevant. If, if you believe, as we do, that um, regulation is going to uh, get worse if, um, well, or relaxed, um, then I think this will become increasingly relevant for a wider range of investors. Um, I, hope, I think the whole point about transparency, I don't, I don't think it gets much more transparent than being listed on a, on a recognised stock exchange. Um, you know, as part of the structure, these companies have to have an independent board of directors, and I think that adds an extra layer of security or sort of endorsement to, to, to the product, um, not least because, um, um, again, you know, if there's a material event that um, impacts the, uh, the company, then the, the board is, uh, is required to, to disclose that via the, via the stock exchange. Um, we can come on to you know, additional benefits such as you know, NEV reporting. But I just want to point out you know, the cons. Um, the press have um, you know, picked up on this permanent capital theme with a vengeance over the last 18 months. Um, I think one, one of the journalists co uh, covered it quite, quite well a week ago when they said that uh, the dirty little secret is that uh, these companies are actually closed-end funds. Um, you know, closed-end funds, all that means is that you know, there's, a limited you know, there's a fixed number of shares in issue, the share price is a function of demand and supply, um, and you know, at times there can be an imbalance. And you know, if you get a, a, you know, an imbalance, then that can lead to a discount to NEV. Clearly, that's not what you want if you're an initial investor and um, you, know, you want to get your NEV, you want to get your private equity exposure through one of these vehicles, and you find that they're sitting at a discount to NEV. The good news is that these companies can can do something about it, and um, I'm sure we'll, we'll come on to that in a second. Okay. Um, we have both direct managers and fund of funds here. Um, it, it would be interesting to know when should an individual invest in one versus the other and what are the key success factors in each. And I'm not just talking about your investment style, which is probably true of your limited partnership investing as well, but um, any particular reasons why someone would want to be in a listed uh, direct manager fund versus a listed fund of funds. We'll throw that out to Joe first as the only fund of funds here. Uh, well, I, it really depends on who the investor is. Uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, <coughs> as Marie said, like the hedge funds, um, those guys are, are trading and they're looking for you know, arbitrage opportunities. And there you are probably going to be more dealing, I mean, you can deal in both fund of funds and direct investment funds, but you're really dealing in the entire spectrum because you're looking at dislocations in the market and helping actually to help liquidity in the market, which benefits all of us. Um, but then if you are a, you know, then the other end of the sophistication spectrum to the single individual investor where you're looking to get exposure to private equity and you don't want to have a gigantic portfolio of stocks, then you know, certainly investing in a fund of funds is the most efficient way because you're investing in a broad, diversified portfolio of private equity funds. Uh, you know, otherwise, you would have to create your own diversified portfolio by investing in the single uh, direct managers, uh, which there's nothing wrong with. It's just administration and, and, uh, and you know, most people don't have the time. To <laughs> and monitor, governance. And then and, you know, yeah. governance and to monitor their portfolio. And so then, and then there's a combination of, you know, in between. So it's, it, it, it's really just a, uh, a function of kind of what your objectives are as an investor. Uh, no, no, you know, one is not good or better than the, you know, bad or worse than the other. It's just, it's how you, you know, what your objectives are, how you want to achieve them, and then factoring the administrative aspect of it. And how about for um, the direct managers, and maybe you want to talk a little bit about what happens when you realize investments in the portfolio, what happens with the, the cash there? Uh, Ian? Well, the, uh, what happens with the cash in these vehicles is it sits on the balance sheet, and the uh, issue that you're <coughs> alluding to is some people think that is a drag on performance. And of course, actually, when you look at the statistics we saw earlier, cash is a drag on performance, and some people might think that's a bad thing. I think the fact of the matter is it goes with the territory. You do need cash when markets are down, and you can always regard it as a strategic asset. Um, it's interesting to know that the basket of IPs in London, notwithstanding cash drag almost every year for the last 10 years of a significant degree, still outperformed the uh, all-share by a handsome margin. It just kind of goes with the territory. 
you could be attracted to things like buying back shares and things like that, but actually I don't think any ex experience tells you that does very little to reduce the discounts in the long run. To, reduce, to, to, to really get investor appetite up and to squeeze the discount to a minimum, you just need to have more buyers and sellers. Which is basically. why we're here. Which is why we're here. <laughs> okay. And, uh, Morris, would you like to talk a little bit about uh, dividend policy and is that an important issue um, for listed private equity? I think it must vary with the, with the particular vehicle. No, I, should, I would like to follow on okay. what you Jan just both. said. Yes, I, I will speak about the dividend policy because when I started in 1995, I had the view that I was going to mirror exactly uh, the functioning of a limited partnership in a listed public vehicle, i.e. that I would distribute all the gains. Obviously, I would not distribute. The only difference would be I would not distribute the capital. The capital would be recycled, but I would distribute 100% of the gain. And very quickly, uh, I realized, we had uh, long discussions with our shareholders, that if you do that, uh, your stock is no more a stock, it's a bond. It's a high-yield bond uh, with variable income, but it's no more a stock, it's a bond. So therefore, we had to revise, our, our, uh, going forward, we had to revise our policy until we came to, basically, all the investors were saying, you know, we are looking at it as a growth stock. But what you are saying is that you invest in private equity, that you are backing growth companies, so we want to view you as a growth stock. So, therefore, uh, we came to the conclusion, and, and I will answer the dividend policy question at the same time, that the best balance, as far as we are concerned, is since we are collecting a 20% carry, then I, I, I felt it was, and the carry obviously is computed in a listed private vehicle differently than it is computed in a, in a, in a limited partnership because you can only compute it on the, on the annual profit. Uh, and therefore, since that is distributed, we took the view that we would distribute the same 20% to our investors. So our dividend policy is very simple, so we distribute 40% of a profit every year, and we reinvest 60% of the uh, 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 of the profit plus, obviously, the capital which is recycled, and and like this, you can uh, show that uh, you can build a model whereby you can demonstrate that you have a growth stock. But I think that does vary quite a lot between vehicles in terms of yeah. uh, the dividend policy. I mean, here, in, in the uh, UK, the tax regime in the UK you are bound to distribute 85% of your income. It's a dividend of interest income you might receive from your portfolio. Your capital gains you can keep in the company. So what happens is you divvy out your income, which tends to probably knock in a yield of you know, a couple of percent on the price of the stock. Everything else is kept within the vehicle tax-free. So that's quite an efficient way of people keeping their money at work. Okay. So we do want to present a balanced view here. Um, let's talk a little bit more about what are the challenges of listed vehicles, again, from the investor perspective. I think Mark referred to some aspects. Uh, Michelle, do you have some comments you'd like to make on uh, information uh, management or on valuations, perhaps? Um, yeah, I mean, what, what the experience we made is that um, through the through listed private equity, first of all, it's was the first time possible to, to, to get a feeling of the valuation of, of private equity companies. Um, and when we started the, the company in 2004, uh, we still had to convince uh, people that listed private equity are in fact doing private equity because people thought, well, um, they cannot do private equity because they are listed. Um, so it was, was a very basic discussion we had. Uh, but now people are well, quite convinced that it's, it's, it's a good tool um, to use these companies as a proxy also to, to get a feeling of the, of the valuations in the market. Um, and um, also regarding correlations, I mean, um, people thought also that listed private, well, private equity is uncorrelated to traditional markets, which uh, is simply not true. And if you look at the figures, um, you can see there's, there is a correlation to traditional, to traditional markets, and it also makes sense that there should be a correlation. So then when it, when it comes up to, to, to valuation, um, you have also to consider um, what is the, is the true um, correlation in the market and um, how, does this, um, how this fit, does this fit into, into, into a model. Okay. Just in terms of disclosure of information, I mean, we're of the view, and I think it's common sense, that more information is, 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 uh, is better than, uh, than, than uh, limited information. And I think that um, 
you know, it kind, kind of annoys us actually that you've still got listed some listed uh, private equity funds that release an NEV on a quarterly basis, um, or semi-annually, or semi-annually, and and you know, some somebody referred to the new generation of, of listings. Well, most of them are releasing monthly NEVs um, with a short uh, lag. I mean, that that even includes some of the um, you know the, the the fund of private equity vehicles, and. I think that's got to be the way forward. Um, Andrew referred to that we also cover listed hedge funds. You know, the majority of listed hedge funds release either daily or weekly NEVs, and I understand that there's a fundamental difference between a listed hedge fund and a listed private equity fund. But um, you know, from an investor's point of view, they're, they're buying into a fund, they're buying into a company with with daily pricing, and I think that you know you need a reference point to be able to um, you know cover the stock in, in both from from, a, from an analyst perspective and in terms of an investor's perspective. And that's ultimately the, the net asset value. Um, so I think you know monthly is, is um, you know, it has to be the way forward. Um, clearly, some of the companies releasing quarterly NEVs or semi-annually, you know, there's an information arbitrage, um, and I think that has attracted some investors, um, perhaps some shorter-term investors, which you know uh, can be good if the company's trading at a discount, um, but isn't isn't necessarily the the way to, to solve the discount problem. So I think um, you know the sector is improving, but there's still a lot further to go. Okay, and from the practitioner's viewpoint, are these valid criticisms, and what can be done about it? Or well, uh, first of all, I, I have to say since we are in a panel, one of the beauty of panels is that you can disagree with the other panelists, and I strongly disagree with uh, <laughs> with, uh, with the view that we should uh, have a, a, a almost a daily uh, net asset value or a monthly net asset value. We provide a quarterly net asset value, and for private equity, I think it's uh, it's the way forward. Now, what I would like to say is that. Um, uh, first of all, as you all know, today private equity is under a lot of, uh, of scrutiny or debate about transparency. And one of the uh, strengths of listed private equity is obviously that you disclose a lot of information, much more information than the limited partnership. So therefore, one of the benefits of listed private equity funds is that you accept the fact that you'll be more and more transparent. And one of the aspects of transparency is performance, because most of the uh, limited partnerships don't publish their performance, and therefore listed private equity, you have to, maybe you don't do it uh, often enough, as my uh, neighbor was saying, but at least you do publish your performance. The other fact which I would like to stress is the fact that today, when you speak about listed private equity, it's really uh, funds or companies, it's a hodgepodge, because a, a lot of, of the largest, of the largest uh, players, we, we gave the name of uh, Vandel, Razeo, uh, Valenberg, or uh, so They report like a corporate. They, they provide consolidated sales number and consolidated profit number and so on. So it creates a, a huge confusion. They don't, they don't report like a, like a private equity firm. They don't report on the, on the key. The key asset, the key number in a private equity fund or unlisted private equity fund is the is the net asset value, the change in the net asset value, because this is the key, the key performance driver, and, and not the PNL, and not the PNL is important only in so much as it dictates what profit you will generate, how much dividend you will pay, as I was saying earlier. But apart from those two numbers, the key issue, yeah, is is really so. There is a lot of work to be done, uh, uh, to be done among the listed private equity funds to unify the way we communicate because uh, not everyone communicates uh, on the same basis. Uh, a second aspect of it is obviously valuation policies and that problem is obviously uh, the same across uh, limited partnerships and listed, uh, listed funds and obviously the more we all adopt the European Venture Capital Association guidelines and so on in terms of valuation, valuing our portfolio, it, it, the better it is because it's more important in listed private equity funds because uh, the investors don't have access to, to the type of due diligence that is done by uh, institutional investors in, 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 limited, uh, in limited partnership. And, and finally, the last word I would like to say is one of the the key problem that we are facing if you have a listed private equity fund is that on one hand your investors want to know a lot about your underlying assets, uh, the companies that you are backing. On the other hand, if we are in private equity, most of the companies that we are backing are private. 
and if they are private, they don't want to have the disclosure, the, all the disclosure which is required from the publicly listed company. So the, the di dilemma for, for us as a, as a manager of a listed private equity fund is you know, how to strike the right balance between providing enough information to our shareholders so that we can assess uh, correctly uh, the, the value of our short stock price, our share price, and on the other hand, not to, uh, to offend our, our investing companies because otherwise if we can't access them, then our performance Will be uh, will be diluted, so it's it's a it's a it's a difficult balance to reach. And finally, another difficulty is that obviously, if you want uh, to uh, to to avoid the discount, a lot of investors want to build their own model, so they would like really to know a lot of information, on not only about the performance of the underlying companies, but the, the financing structure, particularly if you do leverage buyouts, so that they can compute by themselves, they can build their own model in order to, to, you know, to, to take into account any news which is coming into the market and to put it in, right. the, in, in, in the valuation method. So you have, to, you have to deal with all these demands and, and obviously that is, uh, so the industry is evolving and we have to find, as we are, as we are um, uh, going, uh, the right answer to each uh, to each problem. Okay, and I, 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 know it's, I know. go ahead. I know it's good to disagree on a panel, but um, I think we're both probably saying the same thing in terms of transparency. The, the point I just wanted to make is that if you have a, a listed private equity company that's releasing semi-annual NEVs, then potentially uh, quarterly. quarterly, let's say quarterly. Um, you know, the fact is that. You can. There is an information arbitrage there, and it's it's quite likely that that will attract a certain type of investor, which may not be a, um, which may have a more of a short-term um, viewpoint than than the long-term um, institutional investor. And I guess the point is that you know, um, if you engage hedge funds into these vehicles, then you know, discount contracts. What happens then? Potentially, they they, they sell stock in the market. And that adds to the, the, the price volatility. So the point I was just making is that you know more information is, is more information is I think is, is, is um, you know must be the way forward. And um, perhaps not all companies will release monthly NEVs, but I think the fact that some are means that um, it must be you know, must be achievable. Okay, um, Ian, if you wanted to say something on that, but I'm also conscious that we said we would cover the issuer perspective. So perhaps. You could also go on to talk about why a GP would want to offer listed private equity rather than raise uh, an LP fund. So you get two hits quickly. Well, I'd just like to deal quickly with the question of uh, valuations. I disagree completely that valuations should be done monthly. We do them half yearly. And it, for me, it rests on what sort of shareholder do you want. I can imagine monthly valuations is great for creating interest and stock and turning over the stock and creating commissions, which is interesting to the brokers, but I'm not terribly interested interest into the investors themselves or indeed the trust or the vehicle. What are the consequences? Uh, the other point to make about valuations is every valuation of an individual stock, whilst it's based on very sound methodology, which I believe now is pretty consistently applied by just about everybody in the private equity industry, and this is a methodology tested over decades actually, nothing new about it. Every valuation at an individual stock level is wrong. So to undertake a valuation on a monthly basis is trying to record a degree of precision that isn't really there. Key thing for investors on valuations, I always think, is to make sure that the realised value is at a significant premium to the holding value from the immediately preceding valuation period. So you value it at one, and maybe you sell it at one and a half, and that's what investors want to see. Now, if we um, if we were to value monthly, what would the consequences be? I think the first one would be huge cost. A valuation exercise is not Mickey Mouse. It takes a lot of time. You do it every month. You have to check every every line of a financial statement, every rating you've got an update. For what purpose? <coughs> Opportunity costs to the manager. I also think it possibly leads to short-term thinking about how you manage your vehicle, which is not what we're about. We're about offering a product to patient, smart investors. They're the shareholders we want. We don't really want other shareholders in the vehicles. Question then is how do you build confidence and trust given that you're valuing quarterly or half yearly? Well, um, consistent communication, 
uh, identify flag problems very early, hit valuations very hard on the way down, and leave surprises till later. Once you do that, your investors tend to get quite confident in what you're doing, and they afford you significant support. That will be the experience we, we, we have. Last point on whether we ought to have sort of unified guidelines. I think we could raise the bar on minimum standards. I'm also a fan of competition. We all compete for the attraction the attentions of investors, and all of us who run these vehicles should try very hard to communicate very effectively and give investors uh, what they want, but also be clear about the nature of our investment and kind of what we're trying to achieve, and don't be dragged into the um, constant routine of uh, reporting, most of which gets ignored by investors. Otherwise, if it wasn't ignored, you wouldn't have failures like Northern Rock in the UK. Um, Thinking about, uh, just to talk about why a GP would want to run a uh, listed investment vehicle, given the added cost associated, um, we got into it a bit by accident. We acquired another private equity firm that had a little trust, 12 million market cap. It's now 300. It's 14 years ago. Um, what, how has it been beneficial to us? Well, it's diversified our client base, which is quite interesting. It gave us exposure to a list of clients we did, or investors we didn't have before who have converted into our limited partner program. And secondly, perhaps more valuable to our business, it's given us flexibility. Our trust always has surplus capital, and because we've done well, the board have allowed us to try new things. So our entry into Germany seven years ago, which has been very successful, was on the back of capital they allowed us to invest in <coughs> Germany. Far easier to get them to allow that sort of diversification than would be a bunch of limited partners in a, tra in a, in a vehicle where the remit is very narrow. So uh, it's mostly diversification of client base for us and flexibility. Okay. Um, one of the interesting phenomenons is that many of the recent listings, particularly on Euronext, have tended to be funds of funds rather than direct managers. Mark, I wondered if you would like to comment uh, on that, and then uh, maybe we could have um, some commentary from Joe as a fund of funds. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's absolutely right. Um, and, and even... Even companies like KKR that have listed have been um, uh, recently, recently diversified among their existing funds. Um, I think you know, it comes back to who's buying these products. And um, the good news is that the investor base has diversified and, and we believe will continue to diversify. I'm um, always referred to a broad spectrum of, of investors ranging from in private individuals up to institutions. And I think that's reflected quite well in terms of the, the companies that, that have listed, albeit that um, you know, at IPO the minimum investment um, is, is still, you know, the bar is quite high, therefore you know, private investors are typically not uh, involved in, in the primary market. Um, but from my experience, you know, the two, two areas that, that, have, that have delivered um, you know, uh, you know, significant assets of private banks and, and um, institutions which have a formal allocation to private equity and um, for cash management purposes, are using the listed vehicle um, as, a, as, a, as a quick fix, as it were, to, to gain their allocation, to, to, um, to increase their allocation to, to private equity. Clearly, from a private bank's perspective, um, and this is echo echoed certainly in terms of the listed hedge fund marketplace, um, diversification is, is key. And therefore, Clearly, what you're buying into with a, a fund of funds is the is the expertise of the fund of fund manager, uh, not least to uh, do due diligence, but also to select and to get access to 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 um, underlying LPs. And what we have seen are the um, in terms of the fund of funds, the fund of private equity funds that listed on Euronext, we've seen a um, you know highly diversified um, uh, allocation to to both vintages and and sectors. And perhaps Joe can can comment more. Okay, we've got uh, five minutes left, so Joe, if you would cover uh, a little, I'm sorry to, to the short changes, um, a little bit in terms of when you chose to list in July, what you saw as the pros and cons of different legal entities in different places to list. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think just the, the reason that more fund funds have been done recently is that it's just an evolution in the space. I mean, it just started with the direct investment funds, the, the, you know, the three eyes in the world, and then just that's kind of how it began, and, and I think it's just the natural evolution, and it just offers up another aspect of, you know, a, a, another option to, to investors in the listed space. 
when when we were evaluating our uh, options for going for listing, um, obviously the most established market is in London. It's 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 there are you know, the largest players are there, and that's kind of where it started. And it's you know from a size standpoint. But the Lon the, the 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 regs the regulations the listing regulations in London are they, they've been they have recently started to to uh, to you know, make some modifications to them to make it more easy for listed private equity especially in a fund of funds context to uh, to to list. But when we were looking, you know, Euronext certainly has taken a a, a lead in this area and have really you know, crafted their their listing regulations to be to make it very easy and flexible for. A variety of different structures to be listed on their exchange, and so um, you know, it's the old it's the old adage. Nobody really wants to be a trailblazer in these kinds of things. You're going to go where these things have been done before, and so from our standpoint, you know, there's a timing issue. Uh, certainly, you know, having launched in J July, if we just push, if we just had taken us a month longer in August when the wheels came flying off, you know, we may not have been able to been successful with our IPO. And so for us to go and proceed through Euronext, because we knew it had been done there, the Dutch regulators are very comfortable with this asset class and, and our structure, uh, you know, it sailed right through the process. Uh, and, and so you know, it's really a, it's a transaction risk issue for us and I think for anybody who's doing any kind of a public offering. Okay, thank you. Um, and it is important to mention that uh, Paris, the regulators, are considering a, a sort of specialist fund market for professional investors. Uh, in private equity, so we watch with interest to see those developments. Um, I'd like to just speak for a minute about the role of index trackers. Uh, we mentioned the Society General uh, Index Liquid Private Equity, which is on the LPX and exchange traded funds. Uh, is this a, a help or a threat, Michelle? If you could quickly speak um, yeah. about that growth. Yeah, well, um, we, have, we have several products uh, launched for our indices. Uh, but we have also made the experience, I think this is um, what, what has already been, been said, that around six, 70 to 80 percent of the investors that, said, that have invested in, in an LPX linked index product are institutional investors. And uh, when we had our first customer, we thought, well, it would be the perfect product um, for retail uh, clients or for retail investors, but in fact, um, uh, we may exp the experience that institutional investors and also limited partnership investors or pension funds, um, insurance companies, they, they, um, they like to, to invest in both, in, in traditional, in unlisted private equity, but also in, in, in a combination into uh, listed private equity. So um, around 70 to 80 percent are, in fact, institutional investors. I think we are still at the beginning of this asset class and the products that we have seen um, there, um, I think, uh, are just the first products, and we have now competing indices also, uh, which I think uh, is also a good sign um, that it shows that it's it's an it's an asset class, and you can can call it also an asset class. It's not a one-off show; okay. it's a long-term. Um, so it really is a, a particular move for liquidity, uh, uh, even more liquid investing in listed private equity. And I think I'd like to close by uh, asking Maurice if he'd just talk a little bit. One of the great challenges of listed private equity is how do you grow a listed vehicle? And if you have any uh, predictions in terms of how important you think listed private equity will be in the private equity world, we'd be interested in that. Yes, uh, in, in a nutshell, well, first of all, as I said, we, uh, we launched uh, Altamir in 1995 when the private equity market was in the you know, not existent in 1995, you could say. And at that time, Altamir, we raised 12 million euros. And at the time when I raised it, I said, in order to achieve a sig significant size, we had to be a 1 billion French francs. At that time, we were speaking French francs, which was 150 million euros. And uh, we reached that level uh, three years ago, uh, 150, million, 150 million euros. And then, since the, the, the private equity sea had changed, I agree entirely with Ian. I came to the conclusion that you cannot exist in a listed private equity vehicle if you don't achieve one billion. So I said to myself, I started saying to to my shareholders, you know, either we are going to to close that fund because it doesn't make sense because we manage on a global basis 20 billion, more than 20 billion euros, more than three billion in Europe, in France. And it doesn't make sense for me to continue to manage 150 million with all the, the problems of having a listed publicly traded vehicle and so on and so on. 
But then my shareholders were saying, no, look, you have a great portfolio. I don't, we don't want you to, we, we, we want to see the, the benefits of the underlying assets, so we don't want to be diluted. So I was, uh, I was caught into, into the middle. So until uh, one night I had the solution, I said, I'm going to, cr to create the twin brother of Altami. I created Amboise, which we listed on the stock market two years ago, which was going to co-invest alongside Altami, uh, alongside our funds. And then in two years' time, because the market was very active, we were able to, and obviously when I created Amboise, I said at, at some point we would merge the two, the two vehicles when they have uh, reached uh, the same portfolio. This, this happened very quickly, in less than 15 months. And so today we have merged the two vehicles. We took advantage of a merger in July to, to raise an additional 150 million euro. And so today our, our, market, our net asset value is, as I said, half a billion. And uh, we are well on our way to be one billion in three, four years' time. So which is the target uh, which, I, which I have in mind. Now, regarding the second question, where do I see the listed private equity? I see that my, when I took Amboise Public, I said, I view, I think that at some point, uh, listed private equity funds will represent 20% of the total asset under management by private equity, by the private equity industry. So I'm very pleased because for the first time I can, I can look at where do we stand today and due to your work. Um, so what was presented today was that there are 200, roughly 250 firms representing 80 billion euro under management. And if you look at where the, the global private equity is, it's roughly a thousand billion, a, a trillion, with uh, uh, roughly uh, 4,000 firms. And so therefore today, uh, listed private equity represents 8% of the money under management and 6.5% of, of the number of firms. So, so it means multiplying by 2.5% over the next uh, 4 to 5 years, which I think will happen. Okay, and I think we're running out of time. Does any of the panelists have anything they're burning to say that they haven't been able to so far? Well, okay, thank you very much. Give a big round of applause.